Hi, I'm Ian Robinson, Managing Director of Black Star Amplification in the UK. And I'm Laurent Vignal, the R&D Director. Something we've been aware of, um, probably a trend over the last four or five years, something like that, has been um, guitarists looking for more portable, more flexible solutions for their amplification. There's been kind of a growth in the category that people call amp replacement. There was a lot of discussion around what would be the best solution for people. And the thing about amp replacements is that they're, in the traditional, traditional amp replacements are quite technical and they don't actually have an amp in them. And we wanted to do something that was perhaps simpler, more intuitive, but also gave you that feel of using a real amp, which is so combining the two things really, which was giving the, the convenience and the flexibility of you know, some of the format digital processors, but with the ease of use of something simpler and with a real amp in it that delivered the actual tone and feel of a, of a proper valve amp. So that's why we felt that it was a good way to go for us. That's funny, I mean, every single product that we do, it takes ages and ages to get the name. And every time we do it, marketing at the beginning of the, of the project, which would be like 18 months, we say, right, you always say it as well. We need to know the name as soon as possible so that we can get the panels done because it's all, and the handbooks and all that stuff. And it always ends up that, or it quite often ends up that it takes the full 18 months for us to decide on the name. Myself and Paul, um, you know, we, we still are involved very much in this. And that was one where we were just absolutely struggling to find, find a name. And it just, for me, I think it, it might have been, I, I was at home and I was texting Paul about some ideas and it was really just amp pedal because it was an amp pedal and I thought it just sounds like the obvious thing to do. Amped, I thought it sounded cool. So it was kind of my, my idea to do that. And the reason it's amped one is because it was the, we knew that there was more than one product and that they were all for very, very different types of users. So it's like amped one, amp pedal one. It was that simple. And uh, yeah, we thought it was a cool name, exactly what it says on the tin. That's, that's what it did. It seemed to be really popular. So we're happy with that. Yeah, the design process is, is the same for any product we do. So we do um, some uh, technical research at the, at the start. Uh, and then we, we define the product um, in specification or the product in the range. And then uh, after that, we, um, we develop the product. Once we've defined the specification, we know how much it costs, how it looks, all the features and all the accessories that go with it. And then we've done the product um, with the design team. Yeah, I think this was, um, it was one of those where, <clears throat> when we were brainstorming the ideas, you know, we start, usually start with a whiteboard in terms of once we've identified as a market requirement, we'll start with a blank whiteboard and we'll get the, you know, like the, the products team together. And um, on the surface of it, I think, you know, we wanted to use our existing digital platform, you know, which we've used since ID series, Silverline, ID Core. Um, and we already have a lot of um, expertise in valve and solid state power amps. So on the surface of it, putting the two things together was not, was made sense because it shouldn't be too problematic. But I think putting together something very loud and sound, great sounding, that's very reliable and robust in such a small package. That was, actually became the, the biggest challenge of all and integrating in the same physical area the digital part of the system and the analog part of the system yeah. was a big part. And on benchmark was the SG Club 40. So we want to say, can we have something that sounds as good as SG Club 40 in a small pedal format? So we use the SG Club 40 for all the listening tests and for all the setting up of all the levels and everything for determining all the rails for the power and power supply. So we had a, an SG Club 40 and uh, we um, we basically looked at the output of the power amp because we wanted to um, measure that and model that exactly right. 
and then from that we were buffering and putting into the, um, the silver line power amp and then we did some measurement about what the rails need to be so we got variaxial so we can adjust uh, the voltage. But the rails that kind of controls the amount of power oh, yeah. so that's the power supply you can't go effectively you can't go yeah. above the the power supply as it is, so that set the, yeah, the so overall volume. Yeah, so can't remember the, the exact volume, but let's say 70 volt, you know. Uh, and then um, and then we did a lot of A-B tests, so we, we measure all the curves with an inductive load. So an inductive load is um, it's like a speaker, but without the sound. Uh, so it's got all the model of the resonance and the presence uh, of a loudspeaker impedance. And then so we match on resistive load, we match on inductive load, and when everything was matching really well, between our HD Club 40 and, um, and our prototype, then uh, we did lots of listening tests. You know. Because, I mean, valve power is what everybody's after, you know, that's this kind of Shangri-La in terms of, um, of power and performance. And the HD Club 40 for us has a proven track record over like, it's 10 years, at least 10 years old, maybe 12. Um, that that's been delivering on stages all around the world. So we knew if we could get the same perceived volume and feel as a Club 40, then there'd never be any problem in a live scenario with a live drum kit. And I, we did test with a live drum kit as well when we got the solid state set up. One of the first things we did was put it against a bass, a big bass rig and a, against a live drum kit and make sure that it, it reacted in the same way as the valve amp as well. Uh, with current feedback, so something that we've been using for years uh, in all design. Uh, so uh, basically, a valve power stage has got some what's called an output impedance, uh, and then it makes it basically behaves differently depending on which cab you put in. So every time you change your cab, then the response will be slightly different because of the power output transformer and the impedance of the valve. So we reproduce that in kind of solid state circuitry with the help of, uh, of current feedback. And, uh, and then we, we, we can tune the current feedback to make sure that in 8 ohm or 16 ohm you deliver still the, the 100 watt. So the voltage will be lower because the impedance is smaller than the wattage calculation. It's like mathematical model really. Yeah, this uh, the current feedback thing, it's kind of been around, been around forever in terms of electronics. So it's like you can find it probably in valve textbooks back in the day or very early solid state textbooks. But it's first real musical instrument application in volume was actually Marshall Valve State back in the day and Bruce our our founder technical director actually worked on the very original current feedback application back in 1980 something or other and then every every other people had used it but after that they popularized it Bruce helped popularize that and then that was used by everybody else in the industry as it were but I think it's interesting that it's kind of an idea Bruce thought about using current feedback on a class D power amp earlier and he never kind we never got round to it and then I think it was Rob who's like one of our, our main engineers he was he picked up that the the thing that's a little bit unique for us is that we use this we use the application of current feedback but around a class D what's called a class D power amp um, and it worked out really well so in a way the way the power amp works it's a combination of the ID series uh, TVB patent and something more traditional using current feedback. It's both things, isn't it, put yeah. together. So yeah. it's kind of unique. That power amp's got loads going on in it. So it's not just an analog circuit, not just a current feedback circuit. It's also got a load of augmentation for the voice control from the digital circuit as well. So uh, yeah, probably the most advanced power amp of its type around. Yeah, and going back to Bruce Kier, which was our mentor um, and taught us so many things, you know, um, it, it, the approach we've got is always very scientific. So we measure, we model things, uh, and then and then we listen to, you know, which is uh, the cherry on the cake when it sounds exactly as we want. But everything is carefully um, checked and designed, and we want to make sure we understand every single little detail about everything. So that's why it takes time to develop as well. For me, it's always two sides really. One is the guitarist requirement, the artist requirement, which is actually where most of the guitarists and we get a lot of feedback from external. 
There's that. The other half is our internal technical and creative discussions about products because all the time we're trying to drive forward with new ideas, new ways of doing stuff. And that's where the magic happens, isn't it, really? It's talking to people, looking at how people use equipment, what the requirement is, but then just as equally as important is us having internal conversations and always trying to push, to push the benchmark forward in terms of innovation. And that's a bit that we find exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's the most exciting part, the more creative part. I mean, the, the human-centered design is super important because at the end of the day, we, we design products for our customers and we want them to be really happy with the experience and delighted. Uh, and innovation is interesting as well because it's not because something has been done in a particular way before that it can't be improved. So we, we have quite a lot of young guys and with bright ideas and plus some less young but with a lot of knowledge. <laughs> and then when you combine the two, uh, you got some sparking discussions. Uh, and then um, we always think it would be cool if we could do that, you know. And then some people think, well, actually, we can't do that, uh, but we need to change that. And so we change the design. And we've got what we call a stage two process where really there is a research phase where we prove that we can do the technology before we implement into a design, design phase. So uh, that's really important, that research side. Laurent and I have worked together for uh, 26 years. And yeah, we met at Marshall. And actually we had adjoining offices. Um, and I started one day before you, didn't I? Yeah. So back I, in uh, 1995. Back in 1995. So I always tease Laurent that I was the uh, senior. I, senior partner. <laughs> although, but that's not true at all. And um, yeah, we were super lucky. So both of us graduates. Um, and then you were in the UK on some... Were you doing your masters or... No, I was doing underwater acoustic at Loughborough. And uh, one of our friends uh, said, oh, look, they're looking for somebody that play guitar, um, uh, do acoustics uh, and electronics. That's you, isn't it? I said, oh my God, yeah, so... Yeah, so we, we actually, we worked together for eight years at Marshall. And then when we left to start Blackstar, you, you stayed there. And uh, you carried on very successfully as R&D manager at, at, at Marshall. And then when we started the company, you know, we got going and then we were desperate to find a, you know, what we wanted was a really technical person who was happy to manage. And that's really difficult to find. And Laurent's ethics and the things that I think inspire him around innovation and, you know, like doing the right thing and being very technically minded rather than the guruism. Because we were both taught by Bruce, we, we speak exactly the same language technically. And um, yeah, so it was like a dream come true to get Laurent on board and you've been with us... Nine and a half years now, I think. Nine and a yeah. half years, yeah. so yeah, you've probably done... I don't know if you've done as many products for Blackstar as you did for... Not for, yet. for Marshall, but <laughs> I guess yet. between us, how many products have we put to market between us? Two hundred, yeah. at least. Uh, yeah, possibly. At least, maybe <clears throat> more. Yeah, and I, I'm going back again to Bruce. The reason why we were so lucky is that the guy that recruited us, Bruce Keir, um was a mentor. But it's like he was a genius in electronics, and that's the best thing we could have wished for: is, is starting on our career with somebody that was so focusing on engineering and practices, and and um, so yeah. Yeah, so in terms of like the development of, of R&D for Blackstar, it's absolutely fundamental to what we do. And uh, when we started, the four of us, it was like me and Bruce in the garden shed, and then Paul was doing a lot of the ID, Richard was, was building the product, you know, on the patio in the back garden. And then as we formalised that, we've, we've been very lucky to build a full R&D team here. So we have, um, we have mechanical engineers, we have software engineers, we have hardware engineers. So we've built a really, really amazing team now. Laurent heads, heads up the team. Um, and it's for us, we're really trying to integrate all the disciplines together to be as efficient as possible, I think. That's right. We, um, we have a, quite a, a team of very clever people. And then uh, we're trying to make sure that they focus on engineering issues. <laughs> and then we, um, yeah, we get, um, the mix of talent um, combining to each other. Yeah. Part of the secret as well is that we also, our kind of extended team, uh, we have two great manufacturing partners uh, in China. And we're constantly 
you know, yeah, they're friend and partner. Yeah, it's friends not, and partners, it's not just manufacturers. Yeah. And what we do is we we very much have uh, an attitude of we get involve them right at the beginning of the design as soon as possible because we want to make sure that we're using efficiently using the the components and materials that they have readily available. So right at the beginning, there's always a conversation around, you know, what bits have you got? What should we be using? What should we be sharing? Because we don't, for many many reasons, we don't want to be constantly sourcing using new new stuff if they're using stuff already um, then you know in terms of components then we would tend to try and use what what they do and have that discussion early in the design well we have um, um, a very extensive process of testing that covers everything um, from heat test endurance test drop test uh, EMC uh, capabilities and uh, yeah we have like 16 stages of, of testing and we've got a, a room downstairs which we call the endurance testing room where products are being left for weeks and weeks and weeks of full blast you know to make sure that we have not tested at least six or more products. Sometimes we call it the amp torture room yeah. <laughs> when people visit yeah. us. <laughs> and we, uh, we are refurbishing here to be able to test more things in parallel and so yes uh, and it's all uh, monitored by computers so that if something goes wrong during the, the development process, we can go back on the recordings and find out exactly in which order uh, things died and stuff like that. So yeah, we, we spend so much time. I mean, that's coming from Ian philosophy where before we used maybe to test um, uh, stuff at what we thought was acceptable. We test it now to a level where it's got to be uh, the hottest stage in Mexico uh, for a, a concert that's going to be going for a whole weekend, where people playing uh, music all the time and have tiny little breaks. You know, so we're trying to push all our product to a level of um, endurance that is never going to be achieved, knowing that when people use it in the field, then they'll be fine. Do you know what? There's a funny story, James, on that is. I wonder if this is the reason why we're so bloody strict. One is Bruce was really, really strict. So, you know, every single power component is rated at sort of twice the power rating. So for instance, if it's, if it's dissipating half a watt, we'll, we'll specify one watt. So what it basically means it extends the lifetime of the product and things don't go pop. But funny story, when I was in a band in Manchester, um, I like a bit of reverb and I had a JCM 800 and it didn't have any reverb so I had an effects loop fitted, I don't know if you know about this, I had an effects loop fitted by a local engineer who did a brilliant job, apart from it broke down twice in gigs and it was a serial effects loop so when, when it was a loose connection so I think I had some kind of effects processor in the loop, when that broke I basically got that sort of on-off thing happening during the gig. I think I might have had a spare amp, but it's pretty horrible. And maybe that just burnt something into my mind that you never ever want to be in that position where you're live and your equipment goes down because it's just horrible, most horrible feeling. Now, the other thing for us on reliability, really important. You got a kid opens their present at Christmas or you know, you, you're presenting a product with them it's unacceptable for us to have one product not work because that's their dream and that's what they're doing and it means so much to them. And we all know what it feels like to get something and it's not right. And for us, I think, because guitar amps and guitars and all that is such an emotional thing for people, we don't want people to have a negative experience. And it's not for commercial reasons, it's just because we know how that feels. So it is really, really important for us that whole reliability piece is massive. Yeah, tone innovation and, and reliability are the three cornerstone, really. Yeah. yeah. We test it and um, there is a saying that it's going to be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end, you know, so it's got to be correct. That's a brilliant thing about Blackstar as well, I think, is a, the guys who own it are guitarists and we own it. So we can say we don't want to, we're not going to put it out till it's right. And me and Paul are extremely pedantic about that. And sometimes it's not the best thing to do personally and commercially, but we just, we just have to get it right. Yeah. And that's the brilliant thing about working with Ron, it's exactly the same philosophy. I think part of the reason why we, we chose like the ID series Silverline power amp as, a, as the basis for Amped was that it's got some amazing short circuit protection, hasn't it? Which yeah, Bruce designed. Bruce, yeah, yeah. 
uh, in the original ID series, and it's kind of crazy. So you can have the thing running full blast, and you can short circuit the output with a crot lead, and it'll just close down without any problems. And you can do it repeat. Please don't do this at home, but you can. If if you do short circuit that that product, then it's still very very reliable. And we did a lot of work, as you say, it's quite a compact unit. We did an awful lot of work on heat. And also because it's on stage, you've just got to be careful around moisture as well. But as Laurent said, we test for all those things, kind of to the end degree. You know, we test all our products at plus and minus voltages. You know, he mentioned about the Mexico stage. Well, the way you do that is you wind the variac effectively. But then the amount of testing that we do and the test signals that we use are really, really extreme. Quite and, metal. Uh, <laughs> they're quite metal. <laughs> but yeah, they're pushing it to a way beyond the point yeah. of a normal band situation. But you know, the idea is that none of them ever break. And they, you know, when we design an amp, an amp one, two, or if there's any more of them, then um, our plan is that they never break down. So they're not designed to work for five years and then go, oh no, the battery doesn't work. Or, you know, the, the stuff you might get in consumer electronics. They're designed to work forever. I have various electronics and there is a tiny little percentage chance sometimes you can have a, a, a component failure somewhere. So it's like when you say never, never, ever. It's yeah, sometimes that's the idea, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. 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 yeah, but not for my design. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. We don't just design a new bit of technology for the sake of doing it. If we have something that works, we reuse it. I think also what tends to happen is when you reuse something in a new design, you inevitably have to tweak it because no two designs are ever exactly the same. So it's, it's silver line, but we needed the current feedback to allow the different impedance selections automatically. Um, but yeah, that's really important for us is to, is to use the same technology if it's proven. Yeah, if we can. Yeah, always. Yeah, mate, you're right. I mean, we're designing with um, we're designing with 26 years heritage, including our Marshall times, taught by Bruce, who'd been at Marshall 15 years, and you know, and at Marshall we were very for fortunate to have all that heritage behind us as well. And the great thing about the way that we were taught right from the beginning is it doesn't matter if it's digital. It doesn't matter if it's analog, it doesn't matter if it's solid state or hybrid, the, pr the product's got to be reliable and sound amazing. The technology's in some degree kind of irrelevant. So um, that's the way that we've always approached it really. It's the, the right tools for the job really. Yeah, and I'm point is interesting because all the param modeling is all done digitally. Yeah. The, the param inside is just delivering the power at the right impedance, you know. So, um, so there's a lot of work that was done on Silver Line that, that is using Amp1. Yeah. So you could you could say that uh, Amp1 is a bit of a silver line in, in a different form factor. Yeah.